My name is uh, Elliot Cohen. I'm the Dean of Johns Hopkins Dice, and uh, I have the uh, wonderful uh, responsibility to introduce our two speakers today. I'm going to be brief because we don't have a whole lot of time. Our, uh, our guest of honor is uh, General David Goldfein, the uh, Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, uh, obviously a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, one of the country's most senior military leaders, uh, a command pilot with over 4,200 hours of uh, flying experience, uh, having served in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Allied Force, and Enduring Freedom. And we're just delighted to have him with us. Uh, the, your host today is going to be our own Professor Mara Carlin, the director of the Philip Merrill Center for Strategic Studies, and uh, the head, of course, of our Strategic Studies program, uh, with her own distinguished career of public service, uh, as well as scholarship, uh, including the uh, Department of Defense medals for meritorious and outstanding public service. Um, you're all in great hands, General Goldfein. I'm just delighted to have you here. And uh, with that, why don't we begin? Thanks, Elliot. Great to be here. Mara, would you like me to do a couple opening comments? That would be terrific, General Golfing. Then we have all sorts of hard questions for you. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'll, therefore I will make my opening comments very brief and just say uh, thanks to you and to Elliot for, uh, for hosting this. This is uh, actually my last uh, appearance with the uh, Think Tank uh, prior to retirement here in a couple of weeks and change of responsibility. And so let me first just thank you and uh, the team there for you know, being part of the campaign of learning uh, you know, I think as a chief, uh, you, you know, we never stop learning these positions and uh, you personally and both of you have been, uh, had a pretty significant inf influence on, on me as a chief. And so thank you for that. Um, I'm also in the process right now of, uh, of, of running a, what I hope will be looked at as a gold star, uh, best ever transition to my, uh, to Chief 22, General C.Q. Brown, Charles Q. Brown. Uh, uh, CQ uh, and I have served together throughout our career. He was my deputy when we were the, together in Central Command. And I will tell you that there's no better officer to come in to uh, run this Air Force. Uh, he has been, he's commanded, one of the very few individuals that has commanded in combat in Central Command, commanded in Indo-PACOM, he's commanded in Europe. So he knows all of the Air Chiefs for, from pretty much, I mean, his probably has the most vast Rolodex of anybody who's ever come into this position. And he's just a super officer. So I'm pretty excited uh, about this opportunity to transition our Air Force uh, over to him in a couple of weeks. Uh, just a couple of topics I'll throw out because uh, they may come up in our uh, Q&A. Uh, I'd love to sort of share with you how, where we are in the building of a Space Force and how Chief Raymond and I are working on that together. Uh, talks a little bit about uh, you know, what's going on with the National Defense Strategy uh, where we're focused in terms of joint all domain operations. Uh, there's a, just a ton of things we could talk about and I wanna make sure we have time for it. So I'll just stop there. Terrific, thank you so much, General Golfing. It is such a treat to have you here. Uh, I'm really delighted uh, that we were able to do this virtually. Um, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just fantastic and that we can end up being your, your swan song. Um, I will ask you a couple questions and then I know we have a couple hundred folks participating virtually as well. If you all would like to ask questions, please start populating the Q&A. You should know though that I will privilege questions from students in particular. So students, please make it clear that you are one so we can try to get your questions on there in addition to all the smart ones from uh, the journalists, et cetera. So uh, first, um, you are retiring imminently. Uh, it's it's kind, of, kind of hard to imagine. Um, I'd uh, really be curious to hear a little bit about your thoughts on your legacy as chief. What are you most proud of as your time serving as the 21st chief of staff of the Air Force? Yeah, thanks. I'm not, I'm not much of a legacy guy, to be honest with you, but I will tell you that um, I have, I, I do believe that in many ways, the last, the most lasting legacy any leader leaves behind is the individuals that he or she has picked to replace them. And so more than anything, I hope that we have developed and then selected the most talented officers and NCOs in our Air Force, and then put them into key positions, both in joint positions and in Air Force positions uh, going forward. We started off our journey, uh, you know, some four years ago now, 
you know, focused on really three things that all added up. There were key elements to one overall idea, which is how do we focus on joint warfighting excellence and help move not only just the Air Force, but the entire department for forward as the character of war changes, you know, going forward. Nature of war doesn't change. Character of war is, is absolutely changing. And I felt like we could be the thought leaders in much of this going forward. And so the three areas we, we took time focusing on is one, you know, how, what is the fighting for the, the, what is the fighting formation of the United States Air Force? And for an Air Force, it's a squadron. And so we have focused on pushing decision authority resources and focusing the organizational chart so that if we get it right, you know, I'm at the bottom with the secretary and squadron commanders are at the top and the entire organization exists to make them successful because that's where the mission of the Air Force uh, succeeds or fails. It's where we inculcate airmen with the culture of being an airman. So many things happen at the squadron level and it's, defi it's, it's definitive for us as an Air Force culturally. So that's been sort of area number one. Area number two is that, is that joint leader development. You know, it's one thing to advance technology but it's of little use if you don't have the creative leaders that understand more than just air and space that understand, you know, what I've, what I've uh, trying to been pushing, you know, there was one conference where I actually put up a periscope uh, display for the entire conference. And I said, now you may wonder why I'm putting this up. It's because it actually looks a lot like a heads up display on an airplane, number one. And number two, we as airmen have got to understand as much about subsurface warfare and naval maneuver as a sailor understands about air power. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily more, but if we're gonna be joint leaders, guess what, we gotta understand as much. So focusing on joint leader development. And then the third area that we've really focused on is trying to help drive the department forward in joint all domain operations by connecting capabilities that today are just not connected. And uh, I can go into more detail on that during Q and A, but I'm really happy about the fact that we have we have, you know, this journey has gone from, it's been a little bit of acronym soup. I will admit, you know, we've been from. I'm really happy to hear you acknowledge that also. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, you know, you pick your battles, right? So this has gone from multi-domain operations to multi-domain command control to join all domain. But you know what? With every change in acronym we've matured our thinking and it's become more and more joint because if you don't get the J right, then it's not, it's not going to be optimal as a solution for the joint team. So while you know, we have been through some acronyms that get confusing, the journey has been fascinating and I'm really happy with where we are right now because we're beyond we're way beyond PowerPoint charts with lightning bolts that are all aspirational. We are putting forward and showing real capability, real connectivity. We're not just talking about cloud architecture, we've built one. We're not just talking about data architecture, we've built one. And we've demonstrated that capability and every four months we're demonstrating more and the joint, our joint teammates all of us are seeing more and more where we all fit in this concept of joint operations of the future. So I'll try to make my answer shorter. Sorry about that one. But uh, that just sort of gives you a sense of what we've been focused on. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I know the students and the future students heard your reference to Clausewitz and they exclaimed with joy. Uh, so thank you for your character versus nature emphasis. Uh, and in particular, your points on leadership. You know, it is so easy, as we know, having spent thousands of uh, hours dealing with budget battles to just focus on the, the whiz bang gizmos. Yeah. And so the, this focus on personnel is, is just so important. Um, I'd be curious to hear a little bit about the, the sort of the Air Force story, and then maybe we could talk about the joint picture. So the, the Air Force story, you know, there's, there's all this debate about what is it that the Air Force brings to the fight. Some say it's got to be standoff, some say it's got to be stand-in, some say it's got to be both. You know, you've got this future security environment that's looking pretty competitive and pretty dangerous. Can you talk us through what you think the Air Force is bringing to this fight, how well you think that's understood and, and how and in what ways is that changing? So we do leaflets to nukes. I mean, if you wanted to just capture across the spectrum of operations, right? We do everything from intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, 
right? Surveilling the globe all the way to the most destructive weaponry on the planet with two thirds of the nuclear arsenal uh, in the United States Air Force and most of the nuclear command and control. And we operate from uh, 100 feet below the surface in a missile, missile launch facility to the outer reaches of space as a department with our new teammates in the Space Force. So it, it, it's a good question because if you try to just zero in on the Air Force and try to articulate the mission sets, we have the most diverse mission set of any of the services. And what we bring to the table in, in its simplest terms very often is global power without global vulnerability. We're able to project power in a way that doesn't bring a commensurate amount of risk. It's why coalitions tend to come together first. And this is not a parochial uh, statement. You know, nations around the world have the same challenges in their parliaments as we have in our Congress, uh, talking about boots on the ground and putting ground forces in play. But we very often can put air component into play because it doesn't bring the same level of, of vulnerability and risk. And so coalitions of the willing will very often come together in the air first because nations like ours can offer an air component to a coalition before they can offer a ground component. And coalitions of the willing tend to stay longest in the air after ground forces uh, are complete. That's a very general broad statement, but it gives you a sense of what, what an air force brings to the table. And I will just share with you that you know, the, the job of a service chief is to balance three hats. Organize, train, and equip. That's the one that most folks would associate with a service chief. The second hat was equally, if not more important, is a joint chief, being a, a principal advisor to the president, to the, the Congress, Secretary of Defense. And that third hat is an international air chief of the largest air force. And so, for instance, when we were all, we, we, we started the response to COVID, we had, I had 150 air chiefs uh, that we were emailing back and forth, sharing information on how to modify airframes and aircraft to transport COVID supplies and patients. So those three hats in balance, doing leaflets to nukes and everything in between and operating in every domain is what an Air Force brings. It's a really, really helpful perspective and, and shows why you want the U.S. military to be the partner of choice for so many others with that, that COVID example. Uh, I like the punchiness of leaflets to nukes. I wonder if sometimes it doesn't get too fuzzy, though, for folks who are trying to understand and who might feel like, is, you know, what, where is the Air Force focused? How is it dealing with, with these sorts of challenges? So I wonder if you might dr just drill down a little, little bit more. Um, if folks say, well, the Air Force seems to be everywhere doing everything, how would you help them understand, no kidding, here's what the Air Force brings to the joint force. Here's what it is doing that is most useful. And obviously, to the extent you can point to anything, anything in the budget that may be, may be worthwhile, given that we're in NDA moment, of course, uh, that, that would be helpful. Yeah, and I think it might, uh, Mara, be helpful to look at through the lens of, um, you know, compete, deter, win. Mm -hmm. Because very often, it's so easy to start talking in terms of winning phase three active combat operations. But I would offer that what we do in the compete category is as if not more important in many ways, because military power has got to fit within an economic and political framework for it to be effective. And if I'm doing my job, organized training and equipment in Air Force, I'm arming the Secretary of State and our diplomats to be able to negotiate to a better peace. And the adversary needs to know, potential adversary needs to know two things. Number one, I have the willingness and the capability to use military power. And number two, they may not achieve their political objectives if they launch on a military operation. If we can cause them to pause long enough to be able to question whether they can achieve their objectives, then maybe that's what winning looks like mm -hmm. in the business of competing and deterring. All right, so within that framework, then what does an Air Force bring? Mm -hmm. Well, I bring global reach. And global reach means that uh, I would offer that we're a global military and a global power because of global reach. Other militaries can operate regionally. We can operate globally. Every two and a half to three minutes, 24-7, 365, a gray-tailed aircraft is taking off or landing somewhere on the planet. Every three minutes, 24-7, 365, 
No country on the planet does that. We do global vigilance. We are the unblinking eye for the joint force. And whether you want to talk manned or unmanned, penetrating, standoff, the answer is yes, all of the above. Uh, operating from space. So we, we are that unblinking eye that brings not only the exquisite intelligence, but also the analysis that turns ones and zeros into decision quality information. And then the third element we, are, we do is global power. And global power is, is being able to look at the President of the United States, the Commander in Chief, and say, Mr. President, no country on the planet can put a red dome over themselves. Uh, matter of fact, I've, I've told my, uh, in my final two weeks, the PowerPoint uh, producers in the Air Force are, are much more relaxed because I've told them I will execute ChokeCon on the next slide builder that puts a big red dome over China. China can't put a big red dome over itself. No country can. They can put a block of Swiss cheese over themselves. And guess what? We know where the holes are and we know how to get in and we know how to hold targets at risk. No other military on the planet can say that. But I can look the president of the United States in the eye and have told him that we are capable of doing that. That's what an Air Force brings to the table. That's tremendously useful. Um, and based on what you're saying, it seems to make a whole lot of sense then that the Air Force was designated the lead service in the joint all domain operations. Um, can you talk us through, you know, you, you, you alluded to the, the acronym SOUP, that, it, that is um, JADO. Uh, talk us through a little bit about how the Air Force is trying to sync all the services. Um, I can only imagine the profound organizational and bureaucratic challenges that are inherent in this. Um, how, how do you think that's working? Yeah, and just, I wanna be really clear. We are actually not the lead service for joint all domain operations. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs is. Um, and the vice chairman, uh, General Hy uh, Hy John Hyten, is also instrumental in that because he owns the, require the joint requirements oversight process. Uh, what the, each of the services have, has been given a line of effort that we are responsible for leading. Ours is Joint All Domain Command and Control. Excuse um, me. See, acronym and, soup. I've already been flummoxed by. My apologies. Yes. No, no worries. The, 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 the Navy is looking at, you know, global and joint fires. The Army is looking at uh, logistics and how we do a logistics under attack. And so each of us has got an area that we're responsible for leading. But uh, we're in the process right now, pretty excited about this, of executing our prisoner exchange. And so we've worked with, through the joint staff and the director, to have... Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give colonels, my best colonels, I'm going to give one to the Army, one to the Navy, one to the uh, Marine Corps, and they're going to work on that chief's team, on that commandant's team, to be able to ensure that we drive forward on joint solutions. So what we own is command and control. And the command and control element of this is a natural fit because when I was the air component commander in Central Command, and I went to the job thinking it would be my job to assemble air component capabilities and ensure that I understood ground force commander intent and would put the right assets over the top. I didn't actually spend as much time on that as I thought. What I really did was regional command and control for the combatant commander. I had the only headquarters that had a robust team from each of the services that all came together on the floor of this air operations center to be able to do joint operations. So I didn't just have a couple soldiers. I had 60 soldiers that worked for me as the air component commander in a, battle, in a battlefield coordination detachment. I had a complete team of Navy sailors who worked for me. And so my job was to coordinate joint activity on behalf of the combatant commander. That's what every air component commander does. And so it was sort of a natural fit for the Air Force to be, you know, helping think through command and control. The, uh, the, I would say that the, both the challenge and the opportunity is that if you get, uh, you know, we do our best work as a joint team when there's creative friction amongst the services and every service has a voice and it's the lead services job to bring a little bit of humility and an understanding that God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. And we really got to listen. And our joint teammates have got to see themselves in what did we build going forward. Mm -hmm. So when I tell you I'm excited of where we've been on this journey, I will tell you I'm excited because 
I feel like as joint chiefs, we, uh, we, we all have the right picture. We all agree this is essential to our future. And we understand that industry has learned you can't skip the step of building your digital architecture if you mm -hmm. ever want to get to digital capability. And so I'm actually pretty excited with how far we've come. That's really good to hear. So Space Force has come up a little bit. Yes. Let's, talk, let's talk Space Force, not the TV show. Yeah. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of overlap, uh, to put it lightly, obviously, in terms of mission areas. Tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about delineating roles and responsibilities on operations and acquisitions, uh, particularly, I think, going forward as we think about force development. Um, this, this seems like a really interesting organizational and bureaucratical kind of thorny problem. And you've gotten to be chief uh, kind of through the birth. Um, what's working and what, what do you think isn't working or what are you a little concerned about? Yeah, thanks, Mara. So, um, first of all, I will tell you that I'm so relieved on the uh, uh, on the on the Netflix TV show because uh, the original cast, I have to tell you, was Bruce Willis playing Jay Raymond and Danny DeVito playing me. <laughs> right? So, I just will tell you, I'm just so happy that they that they yes. uh, give it a different cast. And he was a lot meaner than you, also the chief that they chose. So <laughs> yeah. clearly, there was no typecasting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been on my own personal journey on the Space Force. I mean, anybody who's listening can go back and look at my opening you know, comments and original testimony. And I wasn't a, a big supporter, but, and I will tell you that, uh, that I wasn't as big a supporter because I was really worried. Having been so involved in my career in joint warfare and integration of space, and I had a really robust space cell in my headquarters, you know, as the, as the air component commander, mm -hmm. I was really worried that we would do that bureaucratic thing right, when you set up new organizations, which would be to separate the air, the space force from joint war fighting in the business of building a separate service, right, that we would mm -hmm. separate. Uh, and we had come so far in terms of integrating space, I was, I was worried about that. And so I went down to my, probably a signature moment for me was I went down to Maxwell Air Force Base and went down and talked to some of our Schriever fellows who are uh, majors, lieutenant colonels that we put into a, almost a PhD program in space. And uh, I could tell that they weren't buying what I was saying, you know, like body mm -hmm. language. And so I just asked them, I said, hey, how many of you think we ought to have a separate service for space? And every hand went up. Really? And I thought, okay, uh, these are my airmen. And I got to start paying, I got to pay attention here. And so I did my own uh I did my own work at that point. I listened, I read, I talked, I went out and worked and, uh, you know, talked to industry. And I, it's, it, I got to a point where I realized that space, especially commercial space was moving so fast. NASA was once again, moving so fast. I had to ask myself, if you're doing leaflets and nukes, what would move us faster as a nation? A chief of staff of the air force doing all of these diverse mission sets mm -hmm. and space or a chief that's singularly focused on space and space operations. And that was my sort of aha moment. So I just share that with you because I'm now, you know, not because I was told to do it because I believe it. I believe that a space force as a separate service is absolutely 100% the right way to go. So now that I'm behind it, my job is to make sure that we build these two services without breaking that integration of joint war fighting. So what Chief Raymond and I have talked about is how do we, you know, the bookends of this discussion in some ways are, how do you build these two services on a foundation of trust and confidence and focused on joint war fighting and the integration of space in every military mission, that would be bookend left. But how do we also allow this new service to have and build its own unique service culture which mm -hmm. tends to identify with the domain in which it operates. Because if we hug it too close, we're gonna slow it down, we big air force. And so those are the bookends that we've been trying to find the sweet spot. And we hope history will look back and say, you know, there was this organization that just did the work, you know? Every time they came to the table, they were prepared, they had analytical rigor behind their recommendations, and they just kept bringing, moving the ball forward, and they brought capability that was relevant. And you know what? That was the Department of the Air Force. These two services had their act together. That's what I want history to look back and, 
and tell us. And so that's where Chief Raymond and I have been focused. That's pretty admirable. I'm struck in particular by the generational chasm you just highlighted. Mm -hmm. That, you know, talking to young airmen, any, any sort of hypothesis as to why they were in such a different headspace than you were? Um, I think for one, there's probably a couple things. Uh, number one, you know, who was it that said if I had, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get the quote wrong, so I don't even try. It had to do with <laughs> how much time you spend on the problem versus the solution, right? Define the problem. Oh, right, the 99 person. If yeah. you have an hour, yes. You're right. Yes, so, <laughs> a so, lot, it turns uh, out. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I don't think I spent as much time as I should have defining the problem. Hmm. I sort of fixated very quickly on my place, which was, okay, I've, I've been fighting. You know, every chief brings a, a different set of skills. One of the things that I bring is a, a, a lot of war fighting, which is sort of what my career has been about. So, mm -hmm. so I, I, I've been there, I've integrated forces, all the joint, my joint teammates and their capabilities. And so I probably was over fixated a little bit in the beginning about joint war fighting and hadn't stepped back and looked at the problem statement more broadly. And the problem statement is that space is moving at an exponential rate. It's moving, you know, two things have happened that have changed the game. Launches become cheaper and payload has become smaller. So it used to be not that long ago that if you were a spacefaring nation, uh, you were operating in the B word, billions. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't an opportunity to get into space for less than a billion dollars. And if you're gonna spend a billion dollars on launch, you better build something really big and really exquisite. So we made large school bus size, exquisite satellites that are up there operating today that are quite frankly, hard to defend. Uh, so, uh, so all of a sudden launch got cheaper and as launch got cheaper and digital engineering uh, moved forward, payload went from school buses to suitcases. And I don't have it with me, but uh, I have a little small cube that's in my office that's a satellite CubeSat. And we'll put 30, 40, 50 of those things on a single ring and then stack them up as we launch them. So that just opened the aperture for you know, countries that were not spacefaring nations to get involved in space. It opened the opportunity, opportunity for business to look at space um, as a profitable uh, area to get into. Um, so that, that, that exponential advancement in space is what, where I think now Chief Raymond, who is exactly the right guy. I mean, he's just absolutely brilliant, you know, and there's nobody better that understands. And the combination of having him there as the, the Chief of Space Operations and General John Hyten as the Vice Chairman of the Joint Staff you know, sometimes history places the right people in the right places. And so we're postured as a department now pretty well to be able to advance quickly. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think there would be an easy transition from Space Force to race relations in the military, but it turns out you actually handed me one, uh, which is which is you effectively, you know, what, what I think we just heard from you is, uh, is there's utility in talking to different sorts of people and yeah. having different kinds of people um, kind of in your bubble uh, and that you're interacting with. And so that, that will then be my transition uh, to, to, in particular, frankly, your leadership and the leadership we saw from Chief Master Sergeant Wright, uh, the leadership that we've seen from General Brown as he's coming in, talking about this giant issue of race relations. Yeah. Um, so uh, curious to hear your, your thoughts on that. Um, you, you've been outspoken. How are you assessing uh, the state of racism, and I might just say broadly inclu inclusivity in the Air Force today? What, what, what needs to be done going forward? Yeah, so I'll bridge, uh, I'll bridge space and race by saying, Houston, we have a problem. So, Very impressive here. Yeah, so, you know, so two things happened when George Floyd was tragically uh, killed. Something broke on the streets of America. And Americans did what Americans always do uh, from the very beginnings of our, uh, our history as a nation. They gathered, they demonstrated, they protested a wrong. Um, albeit, you know, we need to do that, need to do that peacefully, but, uh, but something broke there. And a lot of, you know, uh, I think uh, pent up frustration and anger came, came forward. But something else happened, I hope, and that is something broke loose in the United States Air Force. 
And what broke loose is an opportunity that we've been given to make meaningful, lasting, long-term change when it comes to inclusiveness and belonging in the Air Force. Because diversity is incredibly important, but I would offer that its inclusiveness is a culture uh, across the Air Force, primarily at that squadron level. And it's a sense of belonging is what we have got to uh, invest our time in. And, and we didn't get here overnight and we're not gonna recover overnight. This is a journey that never ends. And so what we've done is that we have a series of actions that we're taking, um, a, lo a lot of it getting out there and listening. Chief Wright and I tried to kick off a dialogue that now is going on uh, at a variety of levels across the Air Force. Um, I had one conversation that was pretty in informative, instructive for me from a young, one of my previous uh, execs who uh, is African-American and he said, Chief, you know, he said, it's the second and third conversation that really matter. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, you know, the first conversation uh, is a little uncomfortable and you're starting to get an awareness and understanding of each other and the different life experiences that we all have. He said, it's, it's when somebody goes back and sleeps on it and thinks on it and then comes back to you and says, hey, I, I've been thinking about what you said. He said, that's the conversation that I'm having right now that's really important. And so history is not on our side here. And I will tell you that uh, I've, I've been uh, talking at every level of command in the Air Force. I said, we, let's prove history wrong this time. If we follow history, we'll get excited about this issue for about two months. And then flu, COVID, hurricanes, you know, wildfires, election will all take, become more urgent and it will push aside the more important. And the important is using this opportunity that we've been given to make meaningful change in our Air Force. And so I've told, uh, you know, as I said, let's prove history wrong. Let's not lose our focus. Let's not lose our momentum on this. You know, I don't know, just you and I talking here, I, I have never been the only woman in a room. I've never been uh, scrutinized to a completely different level than the men in the room. To have everything I say, you know, uh, uh, you know, scrutinized, to have people say things to me that they thought were sort of funny, but are actually pretty demeaning. That's not been my life experience. Every room I've walked into, let's be honest, it's full of me. Uh, and so I don't, I don't know exactly what it feels like to be the only one in the room. I don't know what it feels like to be the only African American, but I'm the chief staff of the Air Force. My job is to understand that. And so I'm hoping that we'll take this opportunity we've been given. I'm hoping that we uh, I'll tell you, we're, we're, we're incredibly serious about it. The last thing I'll say is if we're going to be successful, it cannot be from the top down. It's got to be a combination of top down. I, I can't issue an order uh, for as chief staff of the Air Force and just order people to build a culture of inclusiveness and belonging, right? That's got to happen. It's got to be from the, in, from the gut. And it's got to be at, at every level of organization, officers, NCOs, civilians. Uh, and so... Uh, if you've sensed a little passion in, in my voice and my answer, it's because I think we've been given a huge opportunity here, and I hope we prove history wrong. I really appreciate your leadership on that, and I think I speak for a lot of us who, who you know, it, it meant a lot for us to be able to point to what you were saying and what you what you were doing, um, and and other uh, senior Air Force leaders. Um, it's it was it was noticed. Um, the uh, you're you're getting a lot of questions in the chat about leadership, hmm. and uh, and and on civil military relations. So I want to yeah. turn turn to that in particular. Um, what have you learned as chief uh, about civil military relations? What lessons do you want to pass on to your fellow senior military leaders, but also to the young folks from the Air Force who are who are watching and who are listening, who are trying to figure out how should I work well with civilians how should I think about politics and politicization and all of these mm -hmm. things that only grow more intimidating as we get closer to elections? What, what yeah. advice would you have to share? No, it's such a great timely question. You know, so uh, when you're, I'll share this there, everybody, especially with the young, uh, the students that you have, you know, so one of the things you do is a, when you, when you go before the Senate Armed Services Committee for 
confirmation, there's a series of questions that the chairman asks. And one of the questions is, is will you come before this committee and give us your personal advice, your best advice, regardless of whether it agrees or not with the uh, administration? I mean, it's a Sib Mill foundational question. And if you want to get confirmed, of course, your only answer is I will. <laughs> right. So that's important to unpack because uh, while I am obligated and have sworn to the Senate Armed Services Committee that I will give my advice to my civilian leadership, um, there's never a time where a civilian has to swear that they will take my advice. And I got to understand that and accept that. Uh, and understand that at the very highest levels, my perspective may not be as broad as the commander in chief. So when I think about national security and the Air Force's role, let me tell you what I think about, right? I think about defending our borders. I think about uh, our allies and partners. I think about you know, the, the capability of being able to do the, the unblinking eye for the NORTHCOM NORAD commander. But here's a couple of things I don't think about that are not my job jar. Wall Street, it's actually not what the chief staff of the Air Force thinks about when I drive to work, mm -hmm. right? Um, the uh, uh, roads and bridges across America, infrastructure, uh, interstates, Amtrak is not actually in my job jar. Okay, so what that means is that when I provide my military advice, I gotta accept the fact that the civilian leader that's, that's taking, that's listening to that advice may have a bit broader perspective that they gotta figure out whether my military advice fits into that economic and political framework that they're operating in. And so my advice that, you know, to young, young leaders is first of all, respect the fact that there are those in civi the civilians that have a, an obligation to provide oversight over military operations. I will tell you in four years on the Hill, working with Congress, my experience as a chief has been overwhelmingly positive, both with staffers and members. I found them to be uh, responsive. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that it's been positive is that I've started every conversation understanding that, that in a respectful way, they actually have oversight responsibility over how I spend mom and dad's tax money. Mm -hmm. And that's the way our system is built so that power is shared, right? So that's that. And then I would offer to you that there are key relationships as a leader that you've got to invest in. Uh, almost like, you know, investing in a great marriage, right? I mean, the, yes. you, you, it, 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 it's, not, it's not work, but you got to work at it, mm -hmm. right? If you want to be successful. And so for me, the most important relationship I have with a civilian uh, is the relationship between the chief and the secretary of the Air Force. Because it's interesting, the division of power, uh, uh, the decision authority for most actions in the United States Air Force reside under the secretary. That's how Goldwater Nichols was written. So what does the chief bring? What I bring is uh, credibility with 37 years in the business, and I bring influence of the position of chief. What does the secretary bring? The secretary brings decision authority of the civilian leadership. If you walk down the halls of the, you know, the Air Force, you know, our offices between the secretary and the chief, you will see pictures of secretaries and chiefs. The successful teams are the ones that understood that neither one could move the service alone. Mm -hmm. You actually have, you have to understand that you, you need decision authority and you need credibility to influence to be able to move the service. And so therefore, if you're the chief and you wanna move the service, you gotta invest time in that civ mill relationship and understand and respect the authority of the civilian leader uh, as you move the service. And if you do that and you respect the civilian authority on the Hill, then you can actually accomplish great things. Uh, if you find if you're ever looking at the civilian leadership as an irritant, or in the way, then uh, move aside because you are no longer accomplishing your job. Thanks for that. I think we're, you know, we're really hearing that we should expect tension, 
but we also need to work hard to mend and tend these kinds of relationships um, at varying levels, of course, not, not just between the, the chief and the secretary. Well, it's also, I think, important to think about how we give advice, right? Because the last thing I want to do to a civilian leader is take away decision space. And if I was to like come on this forum, for instance, and offer in a public setting, you know, advice that I'd given privately to the Secretary of the Air Force, the Secretary of Defense, before a decision was actually made, then uh, shame on me for removing decision space that a civilian leader needs to be able to, to operate. And so again, it's just sort of understanding how you move an organization and get to the right solution and be most effective in Civ Mill, I think that uh, is important for everyone to be thinking about. And I will tell you, I think about it every day as chief. That's fantastic and pretty obvious as well, given your successes. Um, I often tell our students, there's not an issue you can touch in national security that doesn't have some mill implications. Yes. You've just got to acknowledge it, figure out what you believe with it, and figure out what the folks that you're working with, what, you know, what their beliefs are on it. Yep. Um, so let us turn to China. You're getting lots mm -hmm. of questions in the chat on China, unsurprisingly. Okay. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you see the Air Force's role in countering the rise of China, um, you know, how, how worried you are about that threat. And I should note, there's also a, a relevant question, which is uh, on um, air superiority and the extent to which you, you worry about that and which you conjure up a future in which um, that, that's kind of perhaps less of an issue, shall we say? Yeah, maybe I'll take the second first, uh, go air superiority, and then we'll go into to, to China. So on the air superiority, I will tell you that, uh, that we as Joint Chiefs are moving beyond um, individual domain superiority for the purpose of just that domain. If I'm achieving air superiority, it's because I'm, I'm achieving air superiority at a fixed time and place to be able to execute joint operations. And I want to leverage and converge capabilities by gaining air superiority uh, so that uh, we can then enable naval operations. So I can enable you know, a brigade combat team to do what it needs to do, or an amphibious operation, or a space operation. So it truly is about, you know, about the domain superiority coming together to converge at a time and place of our choosing. You know, uh, I don't want a potential adversary, because again, remember, what's the purpose of military power, right, is to arm the Secretary of State and our diplomats, and to make sure that our adversaries question whether they can achieve their political objectives with, with the use of military power. All right. So I actually don't want China to be looking out to the east of them in the South China Sea and wondering if they can defend it or whatever. I want them looking up. I want them looking down. I want them looking right. I want them looking left. They better start looking behind them uh, because guess what? Uh, that's what we're building, a capability to come at them from every domain in every direction. And if we can build this right, we will overwhelm any adversary on the planet with so many dilemmas. At an, at an operating speed that is, uh, as, as what we are working to uh, every four months with a, a joint all domain command and control demo that we're doing, we're connecting capabilities, we're moving at machine speeds. And remember, we want, we want our potential adversaries to pause. We want them to question. We want them to worry and wonder whether they can accomplish their objectives. And if we can do that, well, then we win because then our diplomats can can then negotiate to a better place. And so what does an Air Force contribute to that? I, I go back to global reach, global vigilance, global power, C2, bringing it all together uh, and hopefully being, you know, helping as a, as, as a thought leader in this whole idea of joint all domain operations in the future. As I look to China, um, you know, the way I, I, I see it, of course, is, uh, is you know, we have to, collaborate where we can, compete where, compete where we must, and then uh, when called upon, if, if deterrence fails, then clearly we have to be able to win in combat operations. We all tend to, like I said before, you know, so easy as a military guy to just focus on phase three operations, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about compete and deter. So we know with One Belt, One Road that, uh, that the, the Chinese Communist Party has been very clear about its objectives. We're the good guys, and we ought to be unapologetic that we have the winning narrative. Nations around the world have joined us historically because we stand for what's right. Open trade, you know, 
a, a, a free and open Pacific where all can, you know, operate. Um, and so, you know, we're going to continue to compete wherever we need to, but I hope we can also find areas where we can collaborate. You know, it's not just a one and a zero, right? We actually have times in our history where we have found ways to find common interest in one area where we completely disagree in others. I mean, Absolutely. I'll give you an example, right? So while we found, well, well in, uh, for a number of years, we found very little to agree on with Russia below the atmosphere. Somehow we managed to maintain a relationship in space, in the International Space Station, uh, to do research, research and development. Mm -hmm. Throughout some of our worst times with Russia, mm -hmm. we've actually operated together in the International Space Station. So one could argue we found some common interests above the atmosphere and we found very little bit below, right? Mm -hmm. Where are there some common interests with China, right? Economically, and now I'm into, you know, the more of a policy kind of an area. My job as a joint chief is again on the Secretary of State and to try to help create these opportunities for our diplomats because they're able to negotiate from a position of strength. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, really recognizing that these are complex actors, right, and co complex challenges. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of focus, obviously, on China and on Russia and the national defense strategy. Um, it seems like those are the ones everyone's talking about. And so one of the great questions you're getting is, what, what are we, what's the thing that we're not talking about? Yeah. Um, what, what is that that's, uh, that, that you're thinking about? Yeah, so history would tell us that uh, uh, we, we, we don't do a very good job of picking our next adversary. Right, history tells us that uh, that we, we tend to focus here, and then it, and another one, you know, pops up. So, you know, more than anything, I think that what we are thinking about as Joint Chiefs, and I'm thinking about as uh, as Chief Staff of the Air Force, is how do we do truly global operations, and is our C2 structure designed to be able to operate across, you know, physical boundaries that we've drawn on a map? right? Our combatant command, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, doggone it, our adversaries are just not paying attention to our maps, right? So how do we operate? How do supported supporting relationships work? And, and one example I use just to sort of get our mind around it is, you know, a single missile launch out of North Korea. So we're, we have sensors, we're looking, all of a sudden we see an, an infrared event and it picks it up and we have an event and we know now it's been characterized as a, as a missile launch. Who is the supported commander at that moment? Well, it's actually Indo-PACOM commander, right? Well, then that missile starts going vertically and it hasn't tipped to go right or left. It's just going vertically, right? So we don't know right now is actually it's an anti-satellite missile. So as it continues straight up its path, who's the supported commander? Well, at some point it could be the US Space Command commander. Mm -hmm. Well, then it tips and it starts heading over towards Japan. Well, who's the supported commander? Well, it, just went back to Indo-PACOM. But then we characterized it even more and we realized that actually it could make it all the way to our Western shores or into Guam. Who's the, well, now the NORTHCOM NORAD, right? So in the launch of a single missile, we've changed supported supporting relationships mm -hmm. while the missile's been in flight. Is our command and control set up to be able to be that agile? That's what we're working on. Indeed. And, you know, it really makes one question if you don't need to just kind of reconfigure that whole system. I mean, that's such a kind of perfect case study of, of the challenges. The chairman's tried to fix this through global integration. Um, is that kind of the solution that works for you? Or are you more in the diagnosing stage? Something doesn't seem entirely right. We've got, we've got to figure out a new prescription. Actually, I, I'm not uh, in a position of uh, trying to redraw the entire map. Because at, you know, at some point you gotta go back to allies and partners. And you build allies and partners based on, you know, ideals, affections, and interests, right? Ideals are, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, things that we would never walk away with and like-minded nations align with us because their values and their ideals are aligned with ours. Affections are personal relationships that you make over time of trust and confidence that you wanna invest in in times of uh, peace so that you have those relationships available and you're not trying to build them in time of crisis. Mm -hmm. And then the third are interests and that is where our national interests align. And so 
you know, as we look to, you know, building relationships uh, across the region, there's a finite amount of nations that you really can build those close relations to. And right now we probably have it about right. The CENTCOM commander probably has about the right number of nations within CENTCOM to build those long-term trusting relationships that requires continual watering of the garden. Um, UCOM commander, same, AFRICOM commander, same. So I actually, I think from that perspective on allies and partners and building relationships of trust, which I like to quote my friend, Tom Friedman, who says it's the only legal performance enhancing drug, trust, right? Uh, and building those relationships of trust, uh, that, that is COCOM business. And so if you throw all that away, right? That's pretty significant impact on relationships that we've built long-term trusting relationships built over time. The question is, is not to rebuild the map. The question is, how do you not get constricted by the map? Mm -hmm. How do you operate globally if in fact it requires a global operation? You know, if a, if a nuclear element is introduced, how do you operate across the lines of conventional and nuclear so that your C2 systems are supportive of not only the combatant commander, but our allies, partners, and our teammates who are there right shoulder to shoulder with us uh, going forward? Those are all the things that we're thinking about right now in terms of redefining joint all domain operations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, let's turn to procurement for a moment. You've got all sorts of questions on that. Um, there's one, of course, about the F-35. Um, it can get criticized left and right. Is it the aircraft we need or is it the aircraft that we have? Um, is something uh, some folks want to know. And similarly, we've heard a lot about Will Roper Century Series yeah. uh, and sort of that theory on how we think about um, Air Force, uh, excuse me, aircraft uh, procurement. What, tell us your thoughts on that. Yeah. I'd love to. Uh, Will Roper inspires me every single day. That guy is a national treasure. I just want to bottle that energy up. I want to not only bottle the energy up, but I, I keep threatening him that I'm going to put a security team around him because we can't lose, can't afford to lose him. I mean, he's just, uh, he's, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. But on top of being brilliant, he's got the energy and the passion and the ability to communicate in ways that uh, made him incredibly impactful. Effective. So let me talk to the F-35 for a couple minutes, and then let's get to Century Series. So, uh, actually, I'm pretty happy with the F-35, and I'm 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 a, I'm a pretty tough customer uh, when it comes to F-35, KC-46, uh, any of those, right? And and uh, and actually, uh, the nation needs to me me as chief staff of the Air Force, working with the secretary to be a really tough customer. Mm -hmm. And so I took on the F-35 early in my tenure, and asked. Uh, we had a meeting with all the CEOs and I said, um, hey, I, I'm going to get asked a question in Congress and I don't have a good answer. And the question is, hey, chief, why should we buy you more F-35s when you can't afford to sustain the ones you got? I said, I need to have a good answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'll tell you, industry uh, led by Lockheed Martin uh, got after it uh, because the sustainment costs were through the roof, quite mm -hmm. frankly. And the joint program office got after it. And I took 27 stars about several months later, uh, general officers, to the factory, to the company. And we sat down and we went through a very detailed look at how do we scale sustainment of this weapon system, not only for the Air Force, but as important to me for my joint teammates, the Marines and the Navy, who are buying Bravo and Charlie variants, and as important to me as my international teammates out there, the Italians, the, you know, I mean, the, the, all mm -hmm. of our teammates, the Brits who are buying this weapon system, the Australians, because we need them uh, in the business of fifth generation because fifth generation is about interoperability. It's not about stealth. It's about information fusion. It's about, it's about the Israeli air chief telling me, hey, Dave, I'm not integrating uh, the F-35 into the Israeli Air Force. I'm integrating the Israeli Air Force into the F-35. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm actually really thrilled today that I can look you, Congress, anybody in the eye and say, this weapon system is performing brilliantly um, operationally. And we have turned the corner on sustainment and I believe we're on the right path. 
Now, having said that, I will tell you, we ain't going to take our foot off the gas on this because it still isn't where we need it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, our contracting uh, leaders, our industry leaders know that. But, we, but based on the behavior I've seen over the last several months since I had that meeting, I'm so much more, I'm so much more confident today in the F-35 uh, from an operations and sustainment that mm -hmm. I have been, quite frankly, in my entire time with the program. Okay, so. That's uh, really good to hear. Yeah, second question, uh, remind me. What was uh, it? Se century series. Yeah, what are your thoughts series. on that okay. being the future of uh, procurement? Yes. So the days of, of um, procuring uh, weapon systems where an industry, you know, if you take a look at their, their bid charts, they tend to go very similar direction, right? Uh, research and development's a loss. It's in the red. You just try to minimize your loss, do your, do your R&D where you can, right? And then you try to make that up with procurement, but you're not gonna make a lot of profit in procurement. Mm -hmm. when you look at the bid and the big profits, quite frankly, are in sustainment. Mm -hmm. lock, lock the service into proprietary data, right? Where you have got to, as the company, uh, own the sustainment pipeline. And then because the service is struggling money-wise, they have to buy the weapon system at a lethargic rate, right? That takes many years of procurement. And that entire time, your profits that you can then show to shareholders on a quarterly basis are in sustainment. And so that model, I can't blame CEOs for bidding uh, mm -hmm. that way. And you know what? We're, we got to change that. That's the century series, right? If we value research and development as a technical service, then by God, we better start paying for it. You know, industry can't write off mm -hmm. R&D. What we want them to do and what Dr. Roper has told them is, hey, hey we want you to be a continual R&D. We, we want you to never stop. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, digital engineering and digital manufacture has not only, you know, allowed us to build uh, better airplanes, it's actually building smarter airplanes and, and building it more smartly as we go forward. So... We want to break this model of, you know, write off R&D, you know, minimal amount on procurement. So you sell it to us cheap, you know, hardware, but mm -hmm. man, we get locked into exorbitant sustainment costs over a long period of time. That mm -hmm. model has got to change. And so with digital engineering, and, and I won't name the company, but there's a couple of companies out there who have really advanced digital engineering where they actually design the airplane digitally. And then where we used to take, you know, 100, 200 people on a factory floor weeks and months to put an airplane together because it's digitally engineered and then digitally manufactured, it comes together perfectly the first time you make mm -hmm. a wing and a fuselage. So now we're looking at like seven to 10 people doing, you know, putting an airplane together, you know, a, a wing and a fuselage in a matter of hours or single days, that, that, is, that changes the game. Absolutely. Because now what we can do is we can start manufacturing, we can, we can start continual digital engineering, right? And if, we, and if, and if companies will, will, will work with us and go open mission system and not go proprietary on the data, by the way, they're going to have to if they want to sell to the United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, if they do that, then guess what? I can manipulate the data at the speed of relevance. And I can continue this weapon system development. And so I want to get to the point where if anybody comes in and starts stealing our, you know, intellectual property, I'd like our answer to be, it's already old. You can have it. I'm already moved on. I'm in, I'm in block five, block six, block seven. Mm -hmm. And I'm moving so fast, steal what you want. Because I'm moving so fast that guess what? You're probably not gonna achieve your political objectives if you cross the line militarily. That's a really in inspiring perspective. Um, we are just about over time. So if you don't mind, I'll ask you one final question. Sure. Um, so knowing this, uh, th this comes from, uh, from, from the audience, I think it's a terrific one. Knowing what you know today, as you're, as you're wrapping up your time as chief, uh, what would you have done differently if you could? Or what is your unfinished business? 
Yes, thanks. You know, I don't, I don't really have, uh, you know, I don't, I remember a, a exit interview with President Obama I watched and somebody asked him, so how do you feel? And this was just a few weeks before he was leaving the Oval Office and, 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 and he said, uh, closure, I feel closure. I didn't get everything done I wanted to get done, but we got a lot done and I'm feeling good about where the country is and I feel closure. I, I, I can relate to that interview now where I sit, I, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I feel closure. I didn't get everything done I wanted to get done, um, but we certainly got a lot done and I'm feeling so good. You know, when, when you know, I've, I've, I've been watching General Brown for years. Again, he and I, we essentially lived, you know, in two hooches, you know, and uh, in uh, Qatar for, you know, birds of a year work. I got to see his intellect, his mind at work. He's a, he's a brilliant, uh, operational and strategic thinker. I got a chance to sort of watch him now in his Indo-PACOM. I've seen him interact with Airmen. I mean, he's just absolutely phenomenal. And so I'm feeling great about this opportunity to hand the, you know, hand the Air Force over to a guy that I admire and a good friend. Uh, and so I'm feeling closure. So that I don't really have any particular regrets. I guess if there was one area that I'm not going to miss, I'll share this with you. So today I assigned six six or eight um, letters to family members for airmen we lost. And uh, mm -hmm. I put their name in every letter, uh, the, the airmen we lose, because mm -hmm. I had a, uh, had a gold star mom one time tell me, she says, hey, don't let my son die twice. The first on my worst day as a mom, when they brought me the news, and the second when you stopped saying his name. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I won't miss signing those letters. Mm -hmm. General Goldfein, thank you for your time. Thank you for your tremendous service. Uh, I am just honored that we at Johns Hopkins SICE were able to host you today. And I wish you all the best as you go forward. Thanks, Mara. Thanks to you and Elliot. It's been an honor. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.